Okay, so we've reached our very last lab report itself, lab report five, which consists of labs 40, 41, 42, and 43. Now, technically there is still one more report, which is gonna be your second unknown, but technically that is not a lab report. So this is the last of the five ones that are required for your roughly 15% of lab points that are in the course, right? So let's break down what's actually taking place for this particular report. So there are some critical updates that you should be familiar with in this case. The very first one is, is that depending on which session we're in, depending on which conditions we're in, whether it's hybrid, remote, or even uh, in person, uh, lab 41, the specific techniques on hand washing skills usually gets added or removed depending on what's available. So in this case, we will have lab 41 be available for this particular report. The other piece is that for this final report, these are collaborative labs. That means that the data that you're collecting will be shared by everyone. Everybody will be actually inputting their materials, their information onto a platform on Canvas, usually a discussion board, and which you can fill out your information and go from there. Now, as opposed to all the previous lab reports, this is one of those questions that popped up way at the beginning of the course. And I tried to remind you that only until the very, very last report that we have, we would do this. This is the first and only report that requires a discussion. So those little conclusions at the end, those little lines that you guys see at the bottom, that's where that goes. And then the final piece that this uh, re lab report actually has is that just like all the other previous labs in which we've had to do some sort of remote or hybrid research, we'll provide you with a compendium available with images and data that you can collect. So those are the overall system. So let's kind of go through all the labs one by one to kind of indicate what we're doing. So first we have lab 40, which is the ELISA uh, lab. This is the enzyme linked immunosorbent assay more uh, readily abbreviated as ELISA. And so part of this lab is typically done through all the instructions that we have in the lab manual. We set this up in the lab when we're doing this in person and everybody gets a small little plate that they get to work with, all the samples and get to test it out. However, during hybrid conditions or in remote conditions, these labs have to be modified. And one of these things that uh, the modification allows us is to kind of improvise a little bit more with the plot, with the story of that. So for those of you who read the lab manual, you'll notice that it's based on the detection of West Nile virus or West Nile disease in this case. And so we have six samples available and six uh, possible suspects or patients in which we're deciding, you know, who's who, what's what, what's ha what has happened. But given that we're in a current situation in which right now people are undergoing this exact test as a way to detect people that are positive or have been positive for COVID-19, it gives us a little bit of flexibility. We're actually able to adapt the protocol to kind of reflect more of the times. Considering that we just assume that more likely than not, most of you have had a chance to have this test done. Some of you have had the miscomfort or uncomfort portion of having your nostril being kind of probed with a large Q-tip or possibly a little kind of a skin swab inside your mouth or something like that, this is the actual test that is normally done. So we're going to use that information to create or to kind of adapt the protocol. The protocol itself is the same. The steps involved behind them, the materials involved behind them are all the same. What we actually change behind this to kind of reflect a little bit more of interest is the plot itself, the story associated with it. And I'll show you what that looks like in a moment. Now, what we're actually going to do with the ELISA itself is give you all the information ahead of time. So you'll always, as usual, have a YouTube reference that is already posted and available to you. You'll also have the image compendium available that in this case happens to be combined with the brand new set of instructions. And what I mean by new instructions in this case is the story. Again, the protocol itself is exactly the same. It's not changing the steps, the materials, everything you're doing, same stuff. We're now going to do it to reflect a COVID-19 situation. Now, mind you, every semester it might change a little bit depending on what's going on. But right now we saw that it was pertinent that this is literally happening to all of us. So whenever somebody needs a, a rapid COVID test, in this case, a COVID-19 test, this is the one that they do. It's an ELISA test. It's a swab test that is used through uh, uh, antibodies as a way to detect whether you're positive or have been previously exposed. So that's the plan. 
So once we set this up, then at the end of the materials, you'd still have to write a little report, a tiny little mini conclusion and discussion. For those of you who've seen the lab, you'll see that there's a bunch of little lines at the end of the lab that allows you to write that discussion. That's all we're asking for here. This discussion is not meant to be complex. This is beyond the yeses or nos that you're supposed to be doing in the uh, lab itself. In previous labs, you just say, yes, it changed or no, it didn't. Yes, it grew or no, it didn't grow. Here, that's not what we're looking for. Here, we're looking for your understanding, your ability to detect meaning. What do the results actually mean? Can you interpret the results that you're seeing from this ELISA test? In other words, we're actually gonna give you the story of six different suspects, six possible patients that could have been exposed or have been exposed, and you, with your own analytical skills to be able to figure out, well, based on what the data shows me, this person has been exposed, this person is infected, and so on and so forth. That's what you're going to try and do. So where's the story? Now, again, the plot is still, the, uh, sorry, the instructions are still the same as they are in the lab manual for lab 40. However, the actual new plot, the little plot twist that we have in here is the set of instructions that is posted on Canvas. And so this is a, just a quick example of what this looks like. You should all be able to see uh, the uh, document that you're going to be having posted up on Canvas. So this is a PDF file that'll have the same instructions, the same material that you're seeing in the lab manual. But the only thing you're going to see here change is that now it'll be indicative of COVID-19. So as if we were testing for uh, COVID-19 exposed patients, right? So you can see that. And then what you'll also see is a table of how to interpret those results, as well as kind of what those results look in a more of a visualized fashion to see kind of what goes on inside the plate, where do the antibodies play their role and so on and so forth. And then as we scroll down a little bit further with the data, then you'll see the actual patients. And as I told you, we will provide you with a visual confirmation since we don't have the ability to do it uh, hands-on at this time. You'll see at the end, the compendium itself the set of data that you have to be able to analyze those results, right? This is also available through YouTube. So if you wanna look this up, it's there. So that's what we're setting up. So back to our original presentation. It's been just modded for the plot. So a little plot twist, if you will, but the protocol is still the same. So you have access to the YouTube file, to the actual companion file, which is what I just showed you and the images. So the plot twist images, and YouTube should be everything for this case. So your job is to go through the materials, read it, solve it, if you will, and write a very brief description of what has happened. Here, we're talking about, at best, one paragraph. We're not asking for an, an entire story. We're not asking for pages. Four, five, six statements, maybe, at most of you kind of an analyzing and coming up with what those results mean. That's pretty much uh, the setup for that 40, and you should be able to start once we're done with the uh, the introduction here. So proceeding to the next lab, lab 41, this is the one that usually can get added or removed depending on what we have with time. This lab is meant to analyze your efficiency behind hand washing. Now this is typically done in the lab. So that means we have most of the materials available. We use a really cool substance called blow germ which allows us to kind of put a little bit of dust over people's hands. It attaches itself really well to keratinized cells, so your dry skin. And we allow our students to wash their hands using different methods, times, um, as well as different substances, hand sanitizers, alcohol, soaps, lotions, things like that. And then right after that, after they dry their hands by using a UV light very quickly, we can actually detect how well was the process done, but also if, the actual substance you use, hand sanitizer, et cetera, did anything at all. Now, the only issue behind this is that the glow germ itself is kind of difficult to distribute if you have it one by one. So normally you can't do that at home. So in order to kind of introduce this subject, we've kind of modified this protocol as well. So for this case, the upcoming uh, session, what we'll have is um, the modification of this concept. So we're gonna set this up Today, we're gonna to get the materials that we want today so we can actually perform it on the next session. Now, the idea is today you have enough time to gather the materials and in the following session, you should have it all set up. I'll explain it in a moment. And we are actually going to record it. The premise behind this is so that you can share this information with others. 
The idea is to kind of pay it forward. That's the concept. So what do we need in this case? So the idea is in the next 48 hours for our next session or the next session whenever it pops up is we need some basic materials. First one is quite easy. We need some hand cleansers, right? Any material that you'd normally use that would have something to do with your hands, right? So basics, uh, hand lotion, hand sanitizer, soap, um, anything that you'd normally do at regular at home or possibly even at work to clean your hands, right? That's what we wanna have. As many as possible, even better. If you only have one, no big deal. If you have three or four of them, great. The idea here is to be able to test them all out. Okay, so whichever ones you have available, try to get a hold of them too. Now, what we're also going to need is water. We're gonna need roughly about a gallon of water. This water doesn't need to be anything special. It's good old potable or tap water. And you can have it inside any container. This does not need to be purified or sterile water or anything like that. Tap water from the kitchen sink or the bathroom, that kind of thing works perfectly fine. Okay, so if you have it in a little pitcher and container, doesn't matter. Just roughly about a gallon of water would, well, uh, would work. Now, for the purpose of having a constant experiment, an even design experiment, what we need is going to be bowls. Now, what I'm referring here to a bowl is your classic super cereal bowl. The one you'd have your breakfast in the morning or dinner, whatever it is, a relatively medium-sized bowl will work. But we wanna make sure that they're all the same. So you can have all glass bowls or all plastic bowls or all kind of paper ones, the disposable versions, it doesn't matter. Just make sure that they're all the same, one for each of the uh, samples you're gonna be testing. Okay, so you might need three, four, five of those if you have the chance. You're also gonna need some sort of towel, some sort of hand towel or something like that, right? To make sure one, to kind of clean up, but also so you can dry your hands and work with them. And then here's the interesting concept. You actually need a substance to play with. And so usually the best one we can play with is uh, ground pepper. So we are making a kind of a very, very extreme assumption in which you probably have pepper at home right? So feel free to uh, steal some from the kitchen. If not, you know, McDonald's may be a good source. Not saying that that should be the best source to do so, right? Some fast food joint, some door dashing, something of that sort, you can get some of those extra packets that will work. If not, if you're one of those that is a little bit more culinary inclined, right? Uh, anything flaked from the kitchen, like the little uh, spice racks that you can have, like dried up parsley or uh, dried up uh, basil will also do the trick too. Pepper is usually the easiest one, the most available, but any of those should work as well, right? And then you're also going to need some sort of recording tool. So that means that if you're gonna be uh, remotely working with this, obviously you need a, some sort of computer, some sort of tablet or device to be connected with us while we're doing this, but also you're gonna to wanna to have your phone or somebody else's phone helping you record the actual experiment itself. Because you're going to wanna to record it, you're going to want to share it. And then to make sure you have a good place to record it, a decent work area. We're not asking for a lot here, um, kind of being very, very uh, generous in this case and asking for like a two by three. That's a tiny little table, right? But you know, your kitchen counter will also do the trick. Just make sure you let everybody know you're doing that. Or even some of those like TV trays that people can have in the living room or something like that, those will do the trick too. Just you want to have enough space for you to kind of maneuver, have your recording device set up. And so you can set up all these materials. Now, what we're gonna do and how we're gonna do that, that'll be part of the fun for the next session. But these are the materials you wanna have, okay? So make sure you have the cleansers, make sure you have some water, make sure you have some bowls, and then at least one item that we can use as our substrate, pepper preferably, like I said, ground up, or any kind of dried kind of flaky kind of thing will do the trick as well, okay? So those are the basics. And again, in the next session, you're gonna to wanna to have them ready before we actually do the experiment itself and before we start recording. So for the final two labs, these guys actually go together. So labs 42 and 43 are set up, set up in this case, very similar. Uh, so we combine labs 42 and 43, the uh, testing of antiseptics, antibiotics and disinfectants all in one slightly bigger lab. So the protocol is very similar. We're just setting up different substances here, right? Now for this lab, when it's done remotely or when it's done hybrid, we have the same type of setup. We have a compendium available for you. There's the YouTube materials that you can read. 
and there's all the posted images that you can use. Now, what are you gonna do here is we're gonna be observing the efficacy, the efficiency of how an antibiotic, an antiseptic or a disinfectant can actually kill a particular organism. And so we're presenting you with three different organisms. And what you're supposed to have is use a large plate, a 150 millimeter plate, in which you create a lawn, basically an entire plate full of organism, E. coli, pseudomonas, or something of that sort. And we create this nice little flat surface full of organism. And on that surface, we apply tiny little filter discs, filter paper that has been sterilized, and they're moistened inside disinfectants, antibiotics, or anything like that. The idea is, once we actually have our test substance, we apply it to the entire plate and give it about 48 hours to grow. The idea is simple. If that disinfectant, antibiotic, or antiseptic is effective, you'll end up seeing a little hole, a little gap, what we call a zone of inhibition or a zone of clearance, meaning that that particular substance killed it. And so on this large plate, we usually end up setting up three, four, five, six different substances, test substances, and we see what happens when we test it out on several different organisms. So this compendium shows you exactly that. It shows you the data in multiple situations. So we actually have replicates of E. coli, pseudomonas, and staph, and we test out several different disinfectants from bleach, from hemicleans, to iodine, and so on and so forth as well as uh, several different antibiotics. And now the 48 hours have passed, you can actually see those zones of clearance, those zones of inhibition. Your job is to measure those in millimeters, so the diameter itself, not a radius, so from edge to edge of that zone of clearance, and distinguish how effective that particular substance is. If the ring, if the zone of clearance is small, that means that substance doesn't really do anything to that organism. If that zone of clearance, that ZOI, is really big, that means it works really well against that particular organism. So what you're doing is measuring and comparing sizes, little circles versus large circles. And you compare it across different substances and across different organisms. So your job is to measure those, collect them. You're going to take some averages for these. That's your highest level of analysis here. And then tabulate them, put them in a little table. And then your job again is to establish meaning. The idea to figure out what does that mean? And what we're looking at here is, well, is one organism a little bit more resistant to, the, to that treatment or a little bit more sensitive to it? Is one method better than the other? Is bleach better than iodine? Is soap better than this one? Or is um, penicillin better than tetracycline? So that's what you're doing with that protocol. So we provide you with the images your job is to use the scale that we've given you per slide and measure out the size of each disc. That's zone of clearance. Some of them have them, some of them don't. You measure them out, you take averages, and then it's your job to establish the meaning, to figure out what does it mean? Are these good? Are these bad? Is it good that these resist them? Is it bad that they're not susceptible? And so on and so forth. And so again, same premise, a small paragraph, a few sentences just describing what you're you learning. What is the meaning of the sensitivity or resistance of these organisms against antiseptics, disinfectants, and antibiotics? That's the overall setup. That's what goes into your lab manual and to the tables and into your lab notebook, including the drawings of at least one of those plates with those zones of clearance. Now, to make it a little bit more applicable, since we don't get to do these necessarily at home during remote times or hybrid times, we do have a protocol that you can actually do at home. And so it's still the same setup, but in here, we're only gonna give you one plate, a smaller plate to play with uh, for lab 42. And so here's what we're going to do. We're actually going to use a 100 millimeter plate, a smaller plate in this case, that you were picked up with your kit. You had also an inoculum and inside of it, a tiny little pocket that had six pieces of filter paper. They look like little punch holes. They're sterile filter paper, so don't let it be exposed. And what we're going to do is use any types of substances, cleansers that you have at home as your test substance. Normally we'd have these in the lab so we can use them, but here we're gonna allow you to test whatever you want from home. So now we're also making the assumption 
that you probably have some sort of bleach, some sort of disinfectant, some sort of ammonia-based substance like a Windex, <clears throat> excuse me, or a 409 or something of that sort, um, a Clorox thing, whatever brand, it's not really important, but substance, substances that you can test. And we're also curious about what disinfectants and antiseptics you might have at home. Anything from hydrogen peroxide, iodine, good old methylate, something of that sort will also work. The point is for you to test out up to six things. Now, please be aware that those little filter papers, because they're punch holes, they have a tendency of attaching themselves. So everybody guaranteed got six. You may need to kind of sift them apart and separate them because they do stick together, but make sure you have six little pieces of filter paper. We actually did double and triple count them to make sure everybody had them. So you should be able to find them there. Now, what is the actual protocol at home? What is the modification in this case? So we're gonna take our regular plate that you saw. It looks like a standard auger plate, but it actually is specialized to test these things called a Mueller-Hinton plate. I'm abbreviating here as MH. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna coat the entire plate with the organism you created from last week. Right? We set up a couple of organisms that you can go from, grow from home, one gram positive, one gram negative. Right? You can choose any of the ones you want. You can pick your favorite one in this case. And you're going to take it using the inoculum and pretty much coating the entire plate. So what we're talking about here is really taking your inoculum and kind of painting the entire surface, trying to cover as much as you can of that entire plate. Now, to make it a little bit easier, you can actually kind of cheat a little bit by using a cotton swab, your good old Q-tip type um, tool. Uh, you can just gently moisten it with some water, enough to kind of pick up a good glob of your uh, particular substance, your gram positive or gram negative, and use that guy to paint the plate. It's a little bit faster and a little bit heavier. Now, just be mindful, it's still auger, so you could still accidentally crush it if you put too much weight. What we want is to have the organism not to kind of punch holes through them. Right? So if you can't use the inoculum, if you can take a quick cotton swab, pick up a little bit of your uh, plate that you generated from last week and paint the entire thing as much as you can. You wanna create this lawn. This is what we call seeding. Kind of as if you were doing this in your own lawn at home, putting a boatload of seed inside a uh, dirt patch with the hope that all of it grows as grass, right? That's what we're doing. We're seeding that plate with organism. Now, after you seed it, immediately after, we're gonna go use those filter discs. Now, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna take those discs and you're gonna take your chosen uh, substances, peroxide, iodine, soap, whatever it is, but they need to be in liquid form. So that means you're gonna actually take those discs and dip them in that substance. Now, to make this a little bit easier, we strongly encourage you to use tweezers, right? It's easier that way. Uh, you can take these from home or wherever you can obtain them from. Just make sure you use some alcohol to disinfect them, right? So in between every single uh, situation, you should be able to dip them in some good old ethanol or isopropyl alcohol, and it should be perfectly fine. But what you wanna do is take one disc and barely get it soaked with iodine or with soap or with Clorox or with whatever cleanser you're interested in, just enough for the paper to get coated in that substance. So what we're talking about here is moist, not soaked up in water, not dripping, just, just enough for the substance to be in the filter paper. And then you're gonna apply the disc. The idea is we're gonna let that plate grow for about 48 hours and look for the same thing we just saw from the previous set of slides to see if your cleanser, your disinfectant, your, antibiotic, sorry, your antiseptic here, that has an effect on your organism. Does your stuff at home actually work on real case scenarios? right? The stuff you harvested from uh, your skin, the stuff you harvested from your bathroom, whatever it is, does it really have an effect? And so you have up to six of these to test. All right. So gently moisten it with your target substance, whatever you're interested in, and then put them around the, uh, the actual plate. Now you're going to want to place these evenly around the plate so they're not too clustered together. One of the things that happens is if you over soak them, if you get too wet, they'll start sliding around the plate. We don't want them. We just want them to be just moist enough that they'll stick to the plate, they'll stick to the lawn. So seed the plate, coat it up with the wonderful set of cooties that you created, and immediately after, you're not waiting, 
get those discs soaked, put them inside the substance that you want, and then apply them directly to the plate itself. Now, let me show you very quickly kind of what this looks like, just for a silly little example, right? Here we have a sample of a plate that you're seeing there. And I put all six discs as separate as possible as I could, right? There's one in the center, and there's about five kind of arranged in this cool little pentagon itself. Now, because you have six different substances, you may want to be a little bit more organized, right? So you may want to label them from under the base of the plate. So whenever you apply your first disc, let's, let's say you chose iodine, if you have it at home, soak your disc, get it just wet enough so it can have uh, the liquid inside the filter, and then apply your first disc with some tweezers, right? So immediately raise your plate, or you can kind of lower your head under it, and write like number one or something like that, or even write iodine or whatever, and put them on a list separately. That way you don't forget. After six of these, you might confuse them. So it's important that with something like a Sharpie, you can find out which one is which, right? And so come up with the six substances. Here, I just kind of pretended that one of them was bleach and the other one was a liquid hand sanitizer. Remember, these need to be liquid, right? So you put your little filter papers uh, there, you get all six of them collected and then close that bad boy up and then give them about 48 hours to collect. So this is something you wanna set up now. And so give them at least a couple of days to grow. Now, mind you, you need a substance to seed. So if you don't have a substance quite yet, make sure your lab 19s or whatever source of material you have is grown enough. All we need is just one colony, believe it or not, to grab it with a swab to make that awesome plate. Just one little bit of growth. That's all we need for the, for the setup for this one. So seed the plate, place your test substances, up to six of those in your filter papers using a tweezer, close that bad boy up, make sure you have your la uh, label set up and give it about two days for them to grow. Hopefully, if your disinfectants and antiseptics have an effect, you'll see also little zones of clearance. And those will be the ones you actually get to report also on Canvas by using a discussion board. This is again, a collaborative effort. Everybody's data will be submitted online in a couple of days to see what happened. Did their Clorox, their bleach, did their iodine have an effect on their particular samples? We're actually gonna have a community uh, set of tools here or materials or information data to let us know how effective these things are. So that's the overall plan. So that covers labs 40, 41, 42, and 43 combined that we're gonna start setting up today. And some of them we'll set up in a couple of days and analyze the results as they go.